Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, The Workforce Changed. This is our second webinar and today we'd like to explore the topic of future of work and working from anywhere. We're going to look at this topic through the lens of enterprise, teams, leadership and individuals. Um, and I will be joined by a distinguished panel of guest speakers. Um, I run our digital practice uh, for Capco in the UK and I'm based in London and ways of working is a very large part of our business. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague Banu Kohli who's joined us from Canada and he's part of the digital team in Canada. Before we start, uh, Banu will provide a little bit of context about from Canada and how Canada and companies in Canada have been responding to COVID-19 and, and um, remote work. All right. Thank you, Ella. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Banu Kohli. I lead a digital practice in Canada at Capco, and uh, I spend a lot of time with clients uh, discussing, obviously, delivery, how, how to execute on large programs, and naturally, as in, in recent discussions, um, that has uh, you know, the pandemic and the effect it's had on on executing large delivery programs has been front and center, and it's actually impacted, uh, I think, uh, all of us in, in quite significant ways. But from a Canadian perspective, uh, we have been quite a bit more conservative in opening up, and it varies uh, from province to province. Uh, a number of uh, the employers, uh, Capco included, are just starting to open up as we enter our phase three. And a number of employers that can run remotely, um, including some of our some of our clients, are being even more conservative. And uh, based on some recent surveys that our clients and we have recently done, most employees are actually not ready to come back to work yet. Um, that was a bit surprising, and this is you know just some very recent information that's coming out. And of course, it is different based on the age demographic. Employees 40 and older, as an example, are a lot more apprehensive uh, due to childcare and aging parent care circumstances. And uh, what we're finding is that some employees are already looking to relocate and work remotely indefinitely. Um, and uh, you know, one, one area that has been challenging for us and some of our clients has just been around uh, starting new projects with new teams that have not worked together previously. And uh, so it'll be, you know, it's, I know we'll be talking about some of that today as well. We'll talk about trust and, and some other topics that will that will touch on this as well. And uh, from our uh, from a client's perspective, there's just a lot of paper in the branch and back office in the FIs that has made it challenging to execute on some of the tasks. However, uh, for the most part, working remotely has actually been positive for many organizations that are lucky enough to work remotely. Uh, productivity has gone has not gone down as much as organizations had previously anticipated. A lot of tasks that could not be done remotely previously are being conducted remotely, and uh, this pandemic has put a big uh, has shown a massive light on some of the gaps in the uh, in the digital and digitization agenda of many organizations, and they are. They're working to accelerate this uh, their digital and digitization agenda. But what's interesting is it's not just for customers, but actually they're looking to improve the digital and digitization experience for employees as well in areas such as onboarding and and some of the other tasks that employees perform and interact with uh, the organization on. So what is interesting about this pandemic is just how it could permanently change the way we work, commute, and live. And today we will talk about obviously the future of workforce, future of the workforce. So I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion with the rest of the panelists. Um, and thank you again for joining us uh, for what will be quite an interesting topic. Back to you, Ella. Brilliant, thank you so much. So we wanted to make the session interactive, therefore we're gonna run a few polls during the session and also welcome your questions. So you can post in the chat. Um, and um, thank you so much, Bono, for providing the context. If we look back, it's been remarkable to see how fast we adapted to remote work, but also um, what we've learned. Um, now, as we look ahead, we need to think about how we make it sustainable, effective um, for everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. <clears throat> so first of all, it's Rob Ward, <clears throat> who runs our Ways of Working Practice here in London at Capco. 
Casey Schaffer, who runs Talent and Transformation uh, Program uh, based in New York, but really focusing on remote effectiveness and changing needs of, um, um, of, of talent strategy. Mark Mortensen, uh, Professor of Organizational Behavior from INSEAD. He brings um, more than 20 years of research experience around remote work and really focusing on the evolving nature of collaboration with a focus on global, remote and dynamic teams. Um, Annie Coleman uh, is an expert in culture transformation and really how to build diverse and inclusive organization. Annie is a former uh, global head of culture and client marketing at UBS, really focusing on shifting culture com from culture of compliance to one of ownership and excellence. And Duke Mainz is a partner from Perpetual based in New York, uh, is an organizational psychologist who's helping companies to capitalize on the humanness of the enterprise in order to maximize both performance and happiness. Um, and in terms of the topics that we wanted to cover, um, I wanted to start off with a point of view that Copco have built around, um, around future of work and working from anywhere. We have seen our clients move through three phases. First of all, um, the focus was around rapid response and how to accelerate the remote adoption and provide laptops and tools and, and, and equipment to allow people to work from home and connectivity. We're probably beyond that phase now. We're probably in a phase two and three where we begin to optimize ways of working, focusing on employee well-being, productivity and engagement, but also beginning to think about some strategic elements and establishing future ways of working because the future future will probably um, look a little bit more hybrid and it's very much unlikely to be 100% office-based where we are likely to have um, some working, some people working from the office, but the majority may like to continue to work from home. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, in more detail. At Copco, we created a holistic framework to help our clients think about this topic um, holistically and more strategically. Um, there are four dimensions that we're looking at. First of all, it's people, ways of working, physical space, which is office space, and location strategy and technology. With that, I'd like to hand over to Rob, who'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody, or even good morning. Uh, Robert Ford, um, as Alice said, I lead the Ways of Working team for Capco in the UK. Um, I've been working in this space for quite some time, um, having seen firsthand the inefficiencies that large-scale waterfall delivery can bring, especially when we compare that to the way that agile methods are implemented at scale. Working from home means so much more to us now than it did before the pandemic hit. Um, we've all been given a responsibility to focus on our own health and well-being and that of our teams. Um, I'm confident in saying that most of us who are here today on this webinar would have had to interject at some point in a, in a colleague's life to make sure that they're making the most and able to actually work well from, from home. As leaders in general, we need to keep an eye on the future and think now about what steps we should be taking to assure a smooth transition to this new normal for our working life. And more than that, we're obligated to take care of each other and provide a safe environment that is conducive to modern working where people can thrive. The pandemic then has been this catalyst for change. They say that innovation thrives under adversity and that has certainly happened here. Opinions of the workforce have shifted to accept remote working as a normal part of life. Some of us love it, some of us loathe it, but not one of us can deny that it affords a certain kind of flexibility and an approach which is in pretty stark contrast to the office environments of the early 2000s or even the austerity years. The fact still remains that 85% of millennials say they would leave a job if they're not learning fast enough. And only 41% of CEOs believe they are equipped to deliver their business strategy. Clearly, this shows us that there is a new model of delivery with fast pace, quick response to the market that is upon us. But let's remember, this is nothing new. Agile textbooks have been preaching this for over 15 years. What is different this time around, though, is that we are all affected. This is no longer a topic of conversation just for the IT delivery team. We've all had to take new steps and we've all had to adapt or quite frankly, will become irrelevant in what we do professionally. Many of the clients we've got in Capco are asking their people to complete surveys. 
The results that they're producing are corroborating this position, adapt or face an exodus. If we do look to the future then, what does the post-COVID-19 work world actually hold for us? Well, as Alan was saying, we see this new form of workplace emerging. It's one that puts the employee's choice for how they engage with their employer at the heart of the work they do. One where physical offices have become collaboration centers for teams to innovate and really thrive, to have acceleration and proper intervention sessions. We're seeing organizations grapple with this dichotomy of striving for ever greater agility for their firms, while wrestling with the need for true resilience and cost savings that will be needed in the recession cycle that we're all now facing. Distributed working is part of this new normal. We can't afford to be theoretical about it anymore. Employers need to act now, and in Capco, we're proposing a phased approach then to this future. So, large scale change doesn't happen overnight. We all know this. It takes time to embed behaviors and working patterns. There is an old adage in Agile which says Agile is a journey, not a destination. And as frustrating as that comment can be when I hear it made in some meetings, it is absolutely true. What we face now, we consider these four pillars then to what the future of work that Allah outlined earlier um, involve. So if we come if we imagine this reimagined workforce, then what can it actually bring? So the first part, better ways of working. This is pivoting to new delivery models, ones that focus on value streams, on key products and key services. Depths to value are not being lost in silos and paused with high levels of work in progress. Lean delivery models keep the work flowing and so keep the business able to respond, pivot and shift. Agile practices absolutely underpin this, but so too does lean thinking and other elements. We need to encourage these flatter structures. We need to actually understand what autonomy means and make sure our teams have it, including the decision making power and a clear enterprise view of the world to inform feedback loops and make the right decisions. When we're wrong, we need to be able to pivot. The physical spaces that we're working in are being reimagined. I'm sure most of you would have seen some form of change in the office that you're in, whether it's the separation between banks of desks, having to use the stairs, not the elevator. There are many examples of it. The banks of desks and the crowded floors are disappearing, just as the wonderful office cubicles of the 80s went in favor of open plan office. I truly believe that what we're seeing now is the next carnation of where we're going from this. There's an opinion or an idea that we're only really working when we're at our computer. If productive work is collaborating and thinking of others, why do we really even need this desk? Most often emails can wait. At the rates that we see in large cities for square footage of prime business districts, why wouldn't we use the space more effectively than just for administration? Technology does have a vital role to play, but it should be enabling this, not limiting or even determining how our workspace is constructed. This brings us on to the third area, people. So attitudes are evolving from engage and command. We're looking at stronger employee value propositions that when we have the best talent, we can keep it. Providing clear pathways, attractive benefits, which promote well-being for family and friends, all give a platform for growth. It is a motivator. And as leaders in this space, we need to be offering it in abundance. So finally on technology. We all know we need technology. It is here, it is part of our world, it's how we operate. It is built on technology. We're seeing smart tech start to creep into our lives at home, and the same is becoming true in offices. There are very good examples out there of fridges that detect low milk supplies and automatically order. There is very clever analytics on meat and revitalization. People are even looking at occupancy rates during certain times of the days and days of the week to see if there's a better platform for sharing office space. Technology is helping us be more creative with our workplace and make the best use of what we have. We need to embrace this, learn something about our environment and make decisions from it. Analyzing data can very powerful insights and it really helps us inform the decisions we're making to make sure we're achieving the results we want. So to wrap up on this section, um, I'd kind of like to leave everyone with a bit of a call to action. Think about the roles that you all play as individuals, as leaders, as managers, as colleagues, and for that matter, as friends and family. How can we really promote the kind of workplace that we want to be part of? Yes, there will be impediments along the way, but don't lose sight of the resilience that we've all started to show through coronavirus and the pandemic. It's only highlights that we need to incorporate more of this adaptability and flexibility in our work environment to maximize productivity and engagement. Embrace the new normal and be ambitious for our future. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, I'd like to um, ask Mark to talk about um, shaping the future ways of working as we prepare um, our virtual and hybrid teams for the long haul. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Ella. Um, I actually really like, Rob said something uh, in, in his, his remarks that really stuck with me. He, and, and now, of course, I'm forgetting the exact words. So, Rob, forgive me for misparaphrasing you. But he said something along the lines of remote work and working from home has become, has become much more real for everybody. And that's actually exactly the way I want you to be thinking about this. Um, as Alan mentioned, I've been studying remote work and working from home, distributed teams, uh, global collaboration, that sort of thing for over 20 years. So one thing just to put in everybody's head and to anchor you on, this isn't new. And for those people who are saying, the world has totally changed, and, and I, I chafe a little bit when people use this phrase, the new normal, uh, A, we don't know exactly what that's going to be, and B, it's not all new. We've actually been doing it, and we've been studying it for a long time. But there are some ways in which it is very significantly and systematically different. As was already mentioned, it is it, it used to be opt-in. I've worked for home, uh, worked from home and worked remotely for many, many years, but I've done that by choice. And I do it when I want, and I do it when it is the most applicable for the work that I'm doing. I get a lot of control in that. Plus, I work from home, but then I also have home home, and I get to be home and I can be on or off at different times. One of the challenges we have is now we are all forced to not just work from home, but also to merge work and family and home together. Now, this is a very tough order, but interestingly enough, I have been coming across over and over comments like the one that's here on the slide, saying, you know, we've been quite positively surprised. It's actually going a lot better than we'd expected. We've managed this transition to virtual work and productivity. You know, we, we've, served, we've managed it, and, and we haven't fallen off a cliff. In fact, I think we're doing pretty well. I've had a lot of conversations with executives who kind of are, they're sort of puffing their shirts up a little bit and saying, you know, we kind of nailed this virtual work thing. It's, it's going all right. And that's true. But there are a few things we have to keep in mind. Number one, this has been a massive social experiment. Part of the reason that things have gone well may in part be because we've been in this sort of honeymoon period. And it isn't just that you've had to do it or you've had to do it. We've all had to do it. We've all had to do it at once. So we've all been thrust into this and there's a little bit of a discount rate. We cut each other a little bit of slack and we say, you know what? Um, maybe things didn't work exactly the way we'd wanted, but we cut you a break because we know we're all trying to deal with this sort of stuff. So there are a few things that I think are really critical that, that we recognize. Again, ways in which this is different. Forced and it's not opt-in, universal, everybody is having to do this adjustment. It is short-term. I mean, now it's feeling like it's getting pretty long-term, but even so, it's only, imagine, you know, stop for a second and realize we've only been dealing with this for half a year. In the grand scheme of things, that's not a whole lot. And again, we're also dealing with it under weird situations of existential threat. Some of us are nervous about our health, about the health and well-being of our family members, things like that. And then again, this unilaterality of it all, that it affects all parts of life. Now, one thing that I think is also really, really important to recognize, and Ala mentioned this, and I think it's really, really critical. There's a big push, and I'm getting, you know, in, in, the, in these few months since, say, February, March, there have been, there's been an onslaught, article after article after article in Harvard Business Review. I, I have you know, contributed to this, I freely admit. Tons of articles, tons of things where people say, look, we can tell you about what the new normal is. Everybody's working from home. You've got to be doing this. This is the key. What you have to realize is the new normal is going to be a hybrid normal. Not everybody is going to want to continue working from home, right? And I think we saw this in some of the, in some of the comments. There are people who are leaning in this direction, who are wanting to work from home, but there are others who are saying, you know what? I can't wait to get back in the office to have those face-to-face -face water cooler conversations, the informal discussions that we know are the oil that greases the machinery and keeps things going. Last thought I wanna leave you with is recognize that that hybrid model itself introduces new challenges. We have all the challenges that, it come, that come from working remotely. We have all the challenges that come from working face-to-face. -face. And now we have a new set of challenges hybrid challenges, because one of the challenges we have to think about is the fact that, you know what, take, for example, as a leader, when I want to do a performance evaluation or review, 
I have to try to maintain my equity and my balance and lack of bias across some people who are in the office all the time. Some people who are in the office never because they're working remotely. Some people who are in the office some days. And even for those people who are in the office some days, some of them are in the office the same days as I am. Some of them are in opposite schedules, so I never actually see them. We're going to have to start thinking about things like balance and imbalance, power dynamics coming from presence, physical presence, also different access to technology, depending on where people are, where they're connecting from, the technologies they have available. So all of these factors mean that we have a very complex new environment. Anybody who says they've got the full secret sauce worked out, take a pause and think about just how complex this really is. It is very tough, but we have a lot of tools at our disposal, and I know all the crew at Capco are working very hard, and they've got some really good ideas there. So with that, I will wrap up my remarks and hand it back over to you, Ella. Thank you so much, Mark. That, that was great. We're running a poll, and I'd like to share the um, results that we're getting through the poll. Um, so, do you believe the organization is ready for a long-term shift to a hybrid work model? 65% of the participants said yes, 35% no. So, it looks encouraging that most of the organizations are thinking about it, which is great, um, and preparing for the future. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce our next, next uh, speaker, Annie Coleman who really will talk about uh, leadership and culture and how leaders can successfully navigate this challenging and evolving transition and what their role is. Over to you, Annie. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. So like Mark, I tend to be rather positive about what's happening, but there's no doubt there are some challenges. I'm going to touch on those briefly. I want to spend most of my time talking about what are the five keys where I think leaders need to focus. I think for me, the number one challenge that we have in this new way of working is the erosion of culture. We think it's being a shared way of thinking that motivates employees to act and behave in a certain way. There's only so much of that that you can continue to get via Zoom and virtual working. And for new employees, it's almost impossible because the way we learn about culture is through observation. It's social cues. It's that embodied experience that we get from all of our senses that we just don't get working virtually. And if we think of another definition of culture as being the way we do things around here, well, what happens when the here doesn't exist anymore? And so I think some of the consequences of that, you're going to get behavioural risk. And with fragmentation and dispersed employees, the social and ethical cues that help guide our behaviour, guide our conduct, fade. We get this ethical fading, if you like. And it means navigating those grey areas sometimes perhaps gets a bit more tricky. One of the things that regulators are particularly concerned about is, that, is the sort of um, building up of tribes where your loyalty to your tribe, your loyalty maybe to the people on your trading desk, starts to become more important to what the overall organisational culture and values will, will, will be. In times of stress and anxiety too, we become more risk-taking, um, more impulsive. It's because we're so consumed with stress and anxiety that we just don't have the cognitive ability to think rationally and weigh up outcomes. So we're much more impulsive, and that's a potential risk. We also get what we call present bias, where dealing with things that are just short term becomes easier, again, because they, they require cognitive um, uh, effort than the longer term uh, thinking and decisions that we do. And so this social identity and, and sense of common purpose gets eroded, I think, the more time that we're not together physically in one place. Um, physical and psychological safety, um, that becomes an issue, and certainly the regulators in the UK are particularly concerned about that. And I quote, they've actually said that a crucial ingredient to navigate the crisis is psychological safety, making sure that employees still have the opportunity to speak up, be listened to. Uh, stress, anxiety, well-being, uh, that goes without saying. People have been productive, but it's often because they're working longer hours, so we've got potential burnout. Creativity, collaboration, Mark's already talked about that. Um, diversity and inclusion, been a lot of focus on that recently, but inclusion is going to be taking on a much broader, a broader remit, as Mark has suggested. It's about how do you make sure there's fairness between those who are in the office, those who are working, working at home. Learning and development, you know, the average half-life of a skill now is only five years, and one billion uh, people's roles are going to have to be upskilled in the next 10 years, and yet learning and development seems to have kind of fallen off 
the agenda for a lot of organisations, given what's going on, but we need to get that refocused again. And then agility, um, things have gone extremely well. I mean, what would have been three or four years to achieve, having everyone working from home, done in a week or two weeks. And so we must remember the lessons from that, the way we managed to cut through bureaucracy and get things done and not lose sight of the fact that we can be much more agile than perhaps we think we can be. And then uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and so uncertainty decisions are ones where we know the risks and we therefore make various options and, and consequences as a result of them. But when things are ambiguous, which they're going to continue to be, it's much harder to make rational decisions because you don't know all the risks. Those kind of decisions, you can't just use your rational brain. You have to use your gut as well, your experience, your gut reaction. And if you're going to make those decisions with your senior leaders, they need to be together physically. You can't do those very well remotely. So let's look on to the, the, the sort of key areas of focus for leaders. And again, inevitably, I'm going to put culture as number one. I think this is a tremendous opportunity for organisations. You've now got the opportunity to completely rethink your organisational structure, this new hybrid way of working and the processes and the, and the procedures that are going to go with that. And you're also going to then have to think about how do you adapt your culture to fit to support this new way of working. And there may be some aspects of the culture that really don't, don't fit anymore. So you need to address those. And I think you really need to have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of having an office? What are you going to use an office for? Um, culture actually comes from the Latin word cultari, which means to care. So I think care is also going to be a really important requirement, has been already, but caring for oneself as a leader to make sure one doesn't burn out, but also care and compassion for employees, really understanding the individual circumstances of each employee, which are going to vary us enorm enormously. There are some who are going to be able to come back to work during the pandemic because, you know, they have to protect other people or protect themselves. Um, so caring for making sure that they have the support that they need for their physical and mental well-being is going to become really even more important uh, for leaders. And leaders really have to put all the stress and the anxiety of the whole organisation, really. And as I said, they make sure that people get that, get that right support. Um, when it comes to communication, that's always been a top skill for leaders, always been a key requirement, becoming even more important now. With a hybrid organisation, you're going to have to use every kind of communication vehicle possible to get your messages out in the, in the right way. And you're going to have to become chief repetition officer. You're going to have to repeat the same message again and again to really make sure it's, it's understood by everybody. And I think also you have to really articulate a compelling narrative of what an achievable future is going to look like. And that means story as well as, well as, well as facts really helping paint the pitch of where the organisation is heading and getting people motivated behind it. But also being really transparent about the changes uh, that are going to be required, the challenges. People have enough anxiety at the moment. They don't need fudging at work. So they want that real transparency in the way that you're communicating to them. But also communicating to them what's in it for them. There's huge upside, as we know, for so many employees who now want to work from home or have the ability to do so. Really make sure you communicate the upside of the changes that may be taking place. Creativity, um, again, a huge area of focus. We have to experiment. There isn't a playbook for how we do this. So in terms of experimenting, also realise that some things are going to fail, but you can learn from that. So have a growth mindset. Try out different ways of people working in this hybrid way and see what works for your organisation. And also understand that you've now got access to a global talent pool and perhaps in a way you've never thought of before. What remote working's proved is you don't have to have people just in your area. You can now access, access talent all around the world. And that's an incredibly exciting opportunity. I think also um, collaboration and, and co-creation is going to be key. And, and by co-creation, I mean two things. One is that we know that one of the key drivers of motivation for employees and therefore being more productive if they have some input into how their role is shaped. And again, what great opportunity we've got now with this new hybrid way of potentially working to sit down with employees, understand their circumstances and co-create with the kind of role that's going to motivate them. Also co-create the future with your employees. Again, what employees want to feel now is some element of control. Stress and anxiety makes you feel out of control. So the last thing is they want is everything imposed top down. So you've now got an opportunity to do large-scale social feedback. 
and co-create the future and get solutions from your employees, many of whom are going to have much better ideas about how you overcome some of these challenges than the leaders will. So, for example, you can do things like jams where you can have a curated conversation over 72 hours that can go around the world and you can get ideas and solutions from your employees. And you can also see which individuals are most excited about enabling them and use those as your sort of culture champions to get those ideas implemented. Again, it's a wonderful opportunity to really, really engage your employees in shaping this future for your organization. And so while there are challenges, Overall, I think this is a really exciting time for organizations. As Mark said, Capco's got many of the tools and the support that you need that can help make this happen. Back to you, Ella. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Annie. I love the topic of experimentation. And we at Capco believe in very much focusing on employee choice and employee well-being um, as we think about the future. And it's a great opportunity to reimagine and rethink the future ways of working. It's wonderful, thank you. We're running a poll and I'd like to share the results. So the question that we're, we are looking at is, has the shift to remote work ha helped or hindered diversity and inclusion goals? So we used to be at 70-30 and now we're at 60-40. So helped 60% and 40 um, hindered, um, which, which is quite interesting. Oh, we have seen a sentiment that uh, perhaps the remote work helped in some ways work-life balance, but at the same time, when you have a house full of children and you're trying to entertain them and do some work, it's very challenging. Um, right, we'll um, move on and I'll hand over to our next uh, guest speakers, um, a pair, Duke and Casey, who will talk about collaboration, culture and well-being. Over to you, thank you. Okay, um, and Casey's allowed me to kick off, so I'll do just that. Uh, I guess what we'll both do is share with you some more specific things that leaders and teams can do that are gonna allow you to move through the framework that was shared earlier. Uh, and, but to, just to kick us off, what I, I'd like to do is, you know, here, here you have a diagram that shows remote working on the left, of course. As Mark's alluded already, that's not new. That's something that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, depending on how that manifested itself in your team or organization. But of course, now we've got a pandemic and the convergence of these two ideas, uh, as you as you have already experienced, is, is uh, creating some interesting challenges for everybody, right? Actually, if you just look at remote work on the left um, and you look at, I've added a couple of C's to, uh, to Annie's uh, five C's, but if you just look at clarity, communication, collaboration and confidence, those were difficult enough to achieve even in a pure 100% office environment. In fact, you know, we know that 73.2% of the time that the requisite level of clarity and alignment is not even present even at top teams in most organizations. So you can imagine now if you're taking that and it's gonna be in a hybrid environment or you, you bring in all this uncertainty and challenges from the pandemic, that gets compounded even more. And just to bring that to life a little bit uh, for you, you, know, you take take clarity again, which is a challenge to to as I just mentioned to secure any time. You add this uncertainty that we have because of the pandemic. What will the future look like? And what we're seeing more and more now, to, you know, in month five, month six of the pandemic, is this sense of imbalance. You know, as Rob noted, that productivity was okay to start, and and you know things seem to be fine. But now we're seeing some exhaustion some mental health challenges and a bit of what we call an imbalance or a lost focus from people. And so this as a leader requires, you know, certainly a leader to step up and a team to step up collectively to, uh, to foster more orchestrated moments where you can catch up and remind people, where are we going? Why are we going that way? Um, what's changed since yesterday, since last week? And guys, what should we do this week? And, most people don't need that normally, but it, this, it's really uh, incumbent now upon leaders to check in more often. And I don't want to confuse that issue with check up. I'm not talking about micromanaging. I'm not checking up on people. We're not talking about managing effort or the way people work. We're talking about managing outcomes. So that's really important for leaders to, to do that. Uh, the other thing is this, this uh, imbalance is creating some distortion in energy, you know, in people, right? They're losing, not, not that they're losing their confidence or motivation, but, you know, because of the uncertainty, you know, they're finding themselves needing more breaks. Of course, they've got their home life to contend with, which hopefully is a pleasant one, but not always, unfortunately. 
Um, and because of this imbalance, right, the leader's job is just about how do I sustain the energy of people on a day in and day out basis, right? Because that becomes a bigger challenge. And as we've learned recently, projects are slowing down. People are not as uh, quick to complete the projects as they used to be. Certainly, we've lost uh, some of that orchestrated, I'm sorry, um, informal sort of collision moments. They're not orchestrated. Actually, what we'd like to propose to you is that as a leader, you need to orchestrate more of those. Um, and that sounds a bit strange. You know, how do you, you know, with everything going on, how do you orchestrate an informal uh, collision, right? Well, we actually have clients on the perpetual side, my company, doing just that. They're actually creating random uh, generators to say, okay, Duke, you need to go spend some time with Allah, you know, this week. And uh, who's Allah, right? So I got to check in to find out. And, and you have a half hour conversation and they're finding some benefit from doing this so far. It's early. It's been about three weeks since they started these campaigns, but I'll, I'll have more on that. But leaders are going to have to orchestrate more of these moments. And the last thing on this slide before I move on is this, this sort of a, uh, some emerging research in loss of presence. What we're finding is that subconsciously when you're working around other people, and by the way, this may sound very rational. It's always, it's always interesting how the research follows and substantiates what we already might know. But, but you know, the fact that you're working around other people subconsciously works in your, your belonging need to give you a sense that other people are there working on some things. Maybe I know them, maybe I don't know them, but they're, they're here and they're doing something that hopefully is productive, right? That's playing on us at a subconscious level and that's missing now. And again, with this imbalance, with this, with this uncertainty, creates all kinds of, of challenges that we face. So much so we even have one client that actually works two hours a day on Zoom without talking to each other. They're actually just trying to give the feeling of the office. So some of these ideas may sound, you know, crazy, but Depending on your culture, you know, to, to Andy's point, depending on your style, there are ways you can foster this environment to keep things uh, productive. So I'll just, I'm not going to spend time going through all of these, but I'll throw out a couple more that I haven't touched on that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, you know, because Mark, you know, Mark and others have talked about this collective embrace. You know, we've all, we're all facing it. You know, vulnerability matters even more. So we're, we're actually seeing teams whose leaders would naturally not think are that vulnerable. Uh, you know, revealing more of themselves and their, their teams are coming closer and closer together. Um, structure matters more now in a, in a way you might not expect. You know, if you want to empower your team, provide some sense of structure, but of course only finding out what the nuances are of their different home, home life considerations and issues and finding the right balance there. It's very, very important. Um, I've talked about the working together. I'd say, you know, on the last one in the middle, guys, it's about getting your meetings right. You know, if you're if you're coming together on Zoom or what have you, blue jeans, and you need to make a decision where you're expecting alignment, commitment, you know, execution and accountability. Again, always a challenge, even when you worked in an office, it gets even tougher remotely. So you need to get really smooth at running those meetings and ensure the level of inclusivity and engagement is there from all of your teams. And there's plenty of tips and tricks that Capco can offer uh, for you in that area as well. And uh, I guess last thing I'd share with you is a pretty neat thing one of our clients did is inspire through transformative experience. Since they couldn't bring people together, uh, you know, as they normally would to have, you know, a good learning session or a good conversation, uh, you know, live and in person, what they did is they asked people to go to their local happy place, whether it's a city rooftop or out in the country somewhere on a trail, whatever. And if they had a signal, they would call in from there uh, and they would share, you know, why that, you know, why they chose that place, what inspires them about that place. And it allowed people to connect at a very, very personal level. And, you know, it really allows you to maximize that vulnerability on the team and then get to higher levels. So, um, yeah, there's a number of things I could talk about here, including uh, one team that blindfolds themselves during those decision and action meetings. They're finding people are much more attentive. They're listening more and they're actually more creative in the process, which is quite interesting. You know, as soon as you, you're locked out with one sense, uh, all of a sudden you're finally to, you're tuning into other areas that actually allow you to adapt and become much more creative. So give it a shot if you're interested. We've got the time. Let's do it. Uh, over to you, Casey. Thanks, Duke. So we've talked about a number of things today, and we also want to acknowledge the fact that change is difficult. Change during a time of stress is even more difficult. So what we wanted to do is just take a couple of minutes to talk about how do you start some of these new habits. 
Um, we've heard some really great examples of what those can be, and we'll talk about some more of those in the, in the Q&A because I'm seeing those questions come in. Um, but when we really start thinking about behavior change, we, need, we have three things that we need to consider in order for that change to stick. One of those things is the motivation. Do you want to do it? The other thing is the ability. Is it something that you can do? And third is a trigger. How am I going to remember to do this thing that is that is new to me? Um, I, one of the examples that I like to use is I was trying to get in a better habit of taking a daily vitamin. Um, I had the motivation. I thought it would make me feel healthier. I had the ability. I owned the pills. They were sat on my desk. Um, what I was missing was a trigger. Um, and so what I did was every afternoon when my cell phone started dying, that would be my trigger to take my vitamin. The two had nothing to do with each other. It was just something that I was already in the habit of doing that I could then build upon. Um, and that's how I created a, a, new, a new habit of taking a, a daily vitamin. Um, one of the things that I do also like to remind people is that even though we are in this time of change, it's not a moment in time. Um, it's, a, it's an evolving process. And we, we, we like to remember that there's also it's also reiterative. And so as you're talking with your teams, understand that even if you had a great understanding of how they were feeling in March, that might be different now that we're in, we're in August. Um, we have a lot of uh, conflicting experiences that are simultaneously true. I am both more productive at work and less focused. I am both uh, really engaged by Zoom calls and I'm totally burnt out on Zoom. And so making sure that you're taking the time to pause, reflect, uh, test and learn as we're thinking about what are the opportunities that we want to create for the future will help us be adaptive in, in the moment and help us understand our teams. Um, and again, whether you're the leader of an organization or a colleague who is interacting day to day with your teams, take the time to really think about the fact that we are in the experiment right now. And in order to truly understand the data set, we're gonna have to do a little bit more investigating. And um, so I will I will turn it over to questions because I, I know that we have a lot of, uh, of questions coming in. Thank you so much, Casey. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to before we start with Q&A, we um, will uh, announce the results from the recent poll. Um, what do you believe are the biggest challenges with a shift to remote work? Number one, effect on employee morale and org culture. 50%, lack of availability of necessary hardware, 13%, impact on collaboration, 33%, security concerns, 4%. So it's not about technology, it's about people, culture, and collaboration. So 83% said that uh, it's about employee morale and our culture. Uh, there is a last poll running, the final one, so feel free to share your votes. And I'd like to start off with a question that we received, or really good questions coming in. Um, a question for, uh, for Mark. Um, you mentioned some of the risks and challenges, pros and cons. Can you show some practical steps one can take, whether it's at the team, colleague level, or at lead manager level, to help us become equally and more or more productive whilst remote working? Also, is there or should there be an NPS, Net Promoter Score, number to, to measure remote working success? So, uh, it's a great question. Um, I think here's where Duke hit the nail on the head, and a number of people have been, have been mentioning this idea of psychological safety, um, also around vulnerability. So in terms of how do we, how do we create an environment um, that is equitable, how do we keep an eye out for these sorts of red flags and all these, these elements, what we want to keep in mind, the, the best tool is the simplest. It's having a conversation. And one of the big risks that we face is that we often assume that people have the same expectations. We assume that people are thinking through things, wrestling with challenges in the same way as we are. One of the best ways we can deal with this is we need to, as leaders, pull. We can't just rely on what has always come for free, which is you can kind of look around, you get a feel, you can see what Duke is doing, you see what Casey's doing, you see what Annie's doing, you see what Al is doing, you see what Rob's doing. You, you can sort of feel all these different things that doesn't really work anymore. Now you're gonna rely as a leader more on a poll. One of the things you need to do is create an environment where people feel comfortable. Also, as, as was mentioned, people are under stress. Casey mentioned people are really, they're, they're dealing with a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty. One of the best things you can do is create an environment of trust. One of the, one of the real, for me, one of the best ways you can do that is show vulnerability. 
Share some of the ways in which you yourself have struggled with this, whether that is work-family balance, whether that is existential threat, whether that is whatever. Share some of those elements as, a, as an olive branch, as a first step to saying, and I need to hear from you. Because my goal here is to make sure that we are being equitable, that we're being fair, because this doesn't affect everybody in the same way. The first thing you need is you need to get that data. Now, the second part of the question, you know, should there be an NPS? Should there be some sort of a, a net promoter score or any, any sort of score for re working remotely? My one sort of pushback is always, why would we score working remotely differently than we score just plain working? Our goal here is to get something done. The playing field may have shifted. We may need to do some adjusting in the way in which we think about it, but I don't think we should be evaluating what we're doing or the way people are doing it in a fundamentally different way. We need to actually think about how do we ensure that we are assessing what we actually want done. If our goals have changed because of the way in which our environment has shifted, the new normal, whatever you wanna call it, absolutely, you need to make some readjustments. But there shouldn't be a separate set of metrics for, especially if we're trying to be equitable, for those people who are working remotely all the time, those who are working remotely part of the time, those who aren't working remotely at all, that's also going to open up a huge headache. Focus in on what you want done. Make sure there is clarity around what those goals are, what those objectives are, how they're being assessed, and then create an environment that draws people to helping you understand what are the challenges that are in their way. That's, in my mind, the best way you can move this forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. Just to, just to complement your answer, uh, I always use the analogy or the two dimensions that are critical to success. Number one is alignment. Number two is autonomy. And that sort of brings it all together. Alignment is about clarity on what we're doing and why. And that's the role of a leader. Autonomy is the trust and ability kind of to, to empower people to deliver. And I think we just, just this current remote work has just amplifies that. Um, I'm also looking at our remote effectiveness and employee experience toolkit, where we have specific modules to really focus on ways of working acceleration or building high performing remote teams. So there are ways of doing it, but it depends on the maturity level within the team. Happy to explore that offline as well. I'll move on to the next question, which is um, excellent. So as business leaders, we have made difficult decisions and accelerated change programs whilst reducing governance to ensure we have been able to continue to work. As a result, we may have put delivered risks in our business. What's your view on how we now ensure the changes we have made? Assure the changes we have made. Uh, Rob, would you like to take that one? Yeah, absolutely, Ella, thank you. Uh, really good question, this. It, it, it touches right on the heart of one of the key premises that um, we talk about a lot in Agile, which is removing the bureaucratic layers, the red tape, the things that stop you from actually delivering value. So it's, it's great to see that um, at least one of you out there is actively pursuing this as a, as a way of doing business. So you're also quite right that um, with the lens that we have for a traditional organization, removing some of the governance layers would naturally give rise to more delivery risk, and it's harder to assure what is going on. This touches right in the heart of what Ella just said about the trust and the autonomy bit. So my, my suggestion or my advice on here is the, the, the key to making sure that things still go OK is understanding what is actually going on. The way we do that with Agile is the transparency of the work that we're doing, whether it's you know collected in a tool such as, you know, well, I won't, I won't name any, but, you know, the many tools that are available out there to manage the flow of work, making sure that the feedback loops for any work that is being delivered is out there. So, for example, if you were to use a two week iteration cycle, how does that demonstration look at the end of two weeks? Who is involved? What is the visibility of what is being delivered? If you look at it with that lens, the worst case you've got is two weeks of delivery risk. And if things have gone wrong, that's the downside and the bit that you need to mitigate. You can always fix it and pivot to a new direction for the next two weeks. Brilliant. I hope that answers your question. Um, now, I'll move on to the next one. Um, how do we ensure that the focus moves from the reimagining the physical environment and the tech that has allowed remote working to looking at the culture and skills we need to put in place to support and ensure our people are resilient? Great question, because 80% of the time we are thinking about physical and the technology. Uh, Annie, would you like to take that question? Thank you. Again, another very good question. So when it comes to, to the culture, as I said, I think we have to reassess 
uh, what parts of the culture are not helpful in this new way of working and what are the core bits that we need to keep. keep. But then as a, a leader of an organization, we have to make that culture visible. Um, and we can do that by when we're doing our communication, which needs to be much more regular, as I said, you win a piece of business. When you do a fantastic transaction, when a team is, has done something exceedingly well, you call that out to the organization, but you align it to the values and the culture. So you explain it was this behavior that led to that win. It was this behavior that led to this team doing so well. You're constantly reminding, as I said, making visible the culture in a way that's not so visible when we're remote working. Um, when it comes to resilience, um, I think one of the dangers that we have to do is that we're not just expecting our employees to do more and more and more. Uh, and that's what we want people to be resilient. Um, resilience is about, you know, being able to overcome challenges and, and learn from them. Uh, and that means that you have to create an environment whereby you do allow experiments to take place. You do allow your employees to take on stretch goals, but you also support them if um, they, they fail. And as long as they're learning from that, that's how they're going to build resilience. And taking on stretch goals and overcoming them with support from the organization is how you build that resilience. But you can also support resilience by two things, really. On the physical side, you can also help build resilience by making sure people do get the breaks that they need, uh, even though they're working from home. That you encourage things like mindfulness, because, again, we know that that helps reduce levels of stress and anxiety for, for people. And there are things that you can do on, on the cognitive side. So sometimes People get very stressed, they catastrophize about things. One way you can build resilience is to kind of reposition something. So again, rather than um, try people being anxious about the fact that, you know, they're going to maybe be working at home most of the time, but only occasionally in the office, you need to reposition that as the opportunity for them. So looking at things like that, that's the way that you're going to be helped to help to, to build your teams and build that, build that resilience. So it's a mixture of both physical and cognitive but it's also being supportive of, of your being a learning organization and encouraging your employees to, to to take on stretch goals and help them overcome them. And that's the way you're going to build that motivation and resilience over time. Yeah, Ali, can I build on that real fast? Of course. Go for it. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think what we have here is with you know more and more organizations becoming purpose driven. And all the, the environment from which we're operating now, right? Here's a rare opportunity for a team to get together. You know, maybe it's a small organization, maybe it's a large organization, I don't know, but to do more than they potentially could have in the past. Uh, and it's going to mean so much more. And we, I had something called repurposing your purpose, going back and thinking about what is this company all about? Why do we exist? And think about what can this team or this organization do now that we perhaps could not have done before? based on the situation. I mean, too often we get our blinders on and we feel like we're a victim. But as we've alluded to with all sorts of comments on this particular webinar, this, is, this could be and is a positive thing in some respects. You have to look at it that way. What could we do now that could be amazing, even legacy building, that was not even an option for us before? And go for it. Brilliant, so true, so true. Thank you so much, Duke. Um, we have one more question. Um, what, uh, for Mark, what leadership lessons do you believe we can all learn from how the U.S. has handled the COVID-19 pandemic thus far? Thanks, Mark. Oh, oh, this is the fun one, the hot potato that nobody wants to answer, but it's, it's also a fun one. I think it's actually really important. For me, one of the biggest lessons is on the danger of hubris in the face of the unknown. One of the things that I think we all have to recognize, and this is very, very applicable to working remotely, uh, we have to recognize that we don't know what the new normal is going to be. Um, and I think we run into very real dangers and very real risks when we think that we do. We say, oh, I think we've got this nailed. We've figured it out. Um, and I think we've seen, obviously, echoes of this, depending on your, your leaning um, in, in the U.S., in terms of, of an overconfidence in the face of something that we really don't know exactly where it's going to go. Again, for me, I think what's really, really important as leaders is that we keep an open mind. We are willing to be vulnerable. We are able and willing to say, look, I actually don't know what the next phase is, but that process of opening the door and inviting people in and saying, you know what, we can work on it together is also one of the best ways to create that shared identity uh, uh, that uh, Annie was mentioning and to really create that sense of a group working together. And that's really the best way that you're going to get a collaborative future out of something um, when you're facing this much uncertainty. 
Wonderful. So thank you so much, Mark. I'll I'll share the, the results of the, the final poll and then I'll try to close the webinar. So the, the, the question was, um, removing the pandemic from the equation, which working model would you choose personally moving forward? Five days a week in the office, flexible in the office when needed, remote when needed, entirely remote, part time on its own schedule. So 100% said five days a week in the office. No, just joking, joking. The, the, the final answer is 88% of the participants said flexible in the office when needed, remote when needed. So it's much more very flexible model. So it's very clear. It's been a great discussion. I'd like to thank you, all the guest speakers, all the participants. I think it was very interactive. We learned a lot from each other. I think um, it's very clear that um, the future is unknown. The future will be definitely flexible and the future work will be flexible. And it's important to think through the various, all the different dimensions when we think about the workforce uh, planning. Um, please feel free to reach out to us, to any of the guest speakers. Uh, very happy to take it offline. I think there is no right or wrong answer. It depends on the company. It depends on your culture. It depends on your business objectives. But it's a great opportunity to reimagine and to think how you work. Thank you for joining.